Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Simon Bonnet, uh, and I'm the Dean of Sydney Law School. And it's my pleasure to be the Master of Ceremonies tonight. Um, but my first uh, uh, responsibility is to introduce Michael West, um, who will, uh, from the uh, Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, and Michael will offer um, a um, welcome to country. Thank you. Thanks, I was going to say Bajadi Gamaru means good day in the local language here. And obviously, um, the law is very important. And knowing that as an Aboriginal person, the day I was born, I was taken away. So I do know the impacts of the law as a member of the Stolen Generations. I've got with me here a message stick. This is obviously looks in the shape of a shield. Because shields for us are not just for defence, they're also for fighting and attacking too. But the point being symbolism, symbolism is all part of our culture, isn't it? Circles on there, concentric circles represent places, like here right now, places you have yet to go, and where you live, where you work, where you're born, and when we pass on to, to another existence. So, um, the paths on there represent all the different journeys that we're on. We're on one big journey called life, aren't we? Dots, time, emotions, our experience, what we encounter, but also it's how everything is connected in the scheme of things. And this one, you know, what I put on this is that we are one mob, one, one mob, one tribe humanity. It's so important to remember that. And you think about the time we live in now. One might say interesting times, one might say disturbing times. Because we've got um, despots and dictators around the world. They always attack the intellectuals, they always attack the media and the arts. I was just talking to the arts people last night about this. The arts can share ideas and emotions, intellectuals can argue points, and the media can actually put those points out everywhere across the public. Now this um, is about law, the LAWC. So when you think about it, we need decent housing, which impacts on our health, impacts on our education, impacts on our employment. And the law, the four levels of law sit behind everything, don't they? And on here I've got some important things about sovereignty. We've never ceded sovereignty. Justice. And I've also got reinvestment. It's not a cost to invest in people, is it? No. It's about, it makes total sense. It makes total sense for society, but it also makes total sense for the economic argument. So you can argue on both sides. And also 1967, a very important year. And also on here about treaty. And there's other things on here about Mabo, about L-O-R-E, our law. And also about stolen. I think that refers to me and others too. And the land that's been stolen and the wages are stolen. And 1992, 1996, I'll let you guys think about that. And terra nullius. How can you have terra nullius when there's people already here for 65,000 years? It's just a lot of crap, isn't it? To put it bluntly in colloquial terms. I'd like to say this land that we're on is obviously the land of the Gadigal, one of the 29 clans of the Euro Nation. And it's important um, to listen to our speakers tonight. When you think about it, as I said, the law is behind everything. It impacts every part of our life and even our death when we pass on. Everything. Before we're born. So we need to pay respects to the elders, past, present and future. Not only Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, past, present and future, but remember your ancestors and pay respects to your ancestors. We all will return to our mother one day and become part of her. It's just a cycle of life. So we have a moment of silence, thanks, to remember and reflect on our journey, but also to pay respects to our ancestors, which is important. We have the Nepean, Georges, Pacific, 
and the Hawkesbury. These are the aquatic boundaries of your nation. To any of my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters out there, we warmly welcome you from the land, the clan, the tribe and the nation you come from. And we all are one mob, one tribe humanity. We warmly welcome all our brothers and sisters from the land, community, family, neighbourhood and ultimately the country you come from, this little planet we share called Earth. On behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, our members, our board and our elders, welcome here tonight. Enjoy tonight, have a yarn, have a conversation. Um, don't hold back, it's important to be honest. And if we're going to really, you know, we've, I guess we've seen over the weekend um, more women enter parliament, which is great. Now we need more people of colour entering parliament, don't we? That will make a difference, it will reflect our society. So on behalf of Metro, our elders, board of members, welcome tonight. Safe journey home, family, loved ones and community. As came out of Redfern, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, and also, can we send out some, I guess, some um, love around for around the world? I think we need a little bit more of that. And um, a lot less of, I guess, hate in the world. And also send out, I guess, our love to um, a couple of our elders who aren't too well. Um, have caught one's caught COVID, another one's oh, not too well either. So Alan um, Madden and also Arnie Ann Weldon have um, not been too well of late. So we hope them are, if we could all set out a, a, a quick recovery and um, do be honest in your conversations and, and um, let's show the world what we can do when we all work together. We should be proud of ourselves over the last few years. We've got more of us here, people's grandmothers and grandfathers and mothers and, and fathers and that. Thank you. I, I do have to apologise because we're down two people. I've got to go somewhere else. Okay. Uh, as you can imagine, it's been quite crazy in um, coming up. And do remember sorry days tomorrow. And um, yeah, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, well, I'd like to uh, obviously echo um, uh, and thank Michael um, for sharing that uh, wisdom uh, with us too. Um, this is a place of sharing knowledge. Um, and tonight's event, obviously, as part of the uh, Sydney Ideas Program, um, is all about sharing ideas. Um, I'd like to welcome you here to, uh, fittingly, the Charles Perkins Auditorium, um, but also to those who are watching uh, live stream. Um, tonight's event, Reconcile What? Or Why White Australia Needs to Rectify Its Wrongs. And um, this is with uh, Tila Reid, proud Wiradjuri and uh, Wawan woman, lawyer, and University of Sydney Law School, inaugural First Nations practitioner in residence. And uh, I have to say, uh, the position is a new one. It's a uh, two day a week and Tila has um, um, contributed so much already uh, in the uh, five months she's been with us and we're delighted uh, uh, to be part of this amazing event. Um, uh, Tila is in conversation with uh, University of Sydney alum alumna, uh, Billy Fitzsimons, um, and uh, she is the editor of The Daily Oz, um, and I will examine the hard questions, the cut to the legitimacy of our democracy. It's an important conversation uh, in the lead up to National Reconciliation Week uh, on the eve of the fifth um, anniversary of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, I should say right at the outset, uh, this uh, wonderful event is uh, a combination of not only fantastic people at Sydney Ideas, uh, it's presented in partnership with uh, Sydney Law School and supported by uh, Minta Ellison. So I'd like to thank, uh, thank our sponsors. Um, a few housekeeping, uh, there is live captioning available. Uh, for those who want to view it, you can head to um, ai-live.com. Um, live.com and uh, enter the um, session ID. Um, and then in any event, if you can't find that, just Google it. <laughs> There's a line, isn't it? Um, you can also uh, join the conversation on Twitter and I'd encourage you to do that at Sydney uh, Ideas and, and feel free to uh, hashtag um, at Sydney Law School or hashtag Inspiring Legal Minds. Um, that's another of our 
um, monikers. Um, so look, um, I just, uh, as I was saying, you know, after, uh, and my, as Michael intimated, uh, the election uh, um, and the new government uh, with its commitment now uh, to the Uller statement, I'm very proud to say that um, uh, last May, um, uh, not this immediate, so last year, um, the Law School's board, that's our formal governing body, endorsed the Uller Statement of the Heart. And uh, um, it's interesting to see um, judges that we now um, are count amongst our um, alumni and uh, uh, very senior legal figures. When they give speeches, they acknowledge and endorse um, the Statement of the Heart. And I think there's a real um, tipping point in relation to the um, drive to address the issues um, outstanding in relations to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in this country. Um, I'm also uh, uh, pleased that there is a short video um, that you, um, later this hour that we'll be uh, playing uh, from Sydney Law School, which demonstrates that support to the Uluru Statement. And uh, you'll hear from also our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor uh, Lisa jackson Porver, who unfortunately is uh, unable to be here in the room, but is, I know, watching online. And uh, um, Lisa has been a, a huge supporter of the work um, of uh, the law school in this area, and um, also um, um, supporting the Practitioner and Residence uh, Project. Um, after the event, I can invite you to join with us for light refreshments. Um, thank you, Minta Ellison, for providing that, one of our um, big law firms uh, downtown, and to continue the conversation and make new connections. Um, we'll also have Q&A, um, um, and we'll be taking questions. There's going to be roving microphones. Um, and um, also Slido, if you're online, you can um, offer questions through that. So um, Tila, in, in many senses, just to give you a bit more of an elaboration of her background, um, uh, a proud Wiradjuri and uh, Wellwyn woman, lawyer, essayist, storyteller, co-founder of the Blackfella Book Club, um, which is a platform uh, that honors First Nations ancestors as the original storytelling, storytellers. Um, she is a senior solicitor uh, practicing in uh, land rights litigation, and uh, as I said, a practitioner in residence here in the university, and she's a, a campaigner um, for the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, she um, played a very significant role as the working group leader on um, section 5126, uh, the race power. It's often not known that we have in our founding document in our constitution a power to regulate races, and in, in its heart, um, it was fundamentally uh, um, built around um, some pretty racist ideologies of keeping Australia white. Interestingly, it accepted um, the Commonwealth's power to regulate indigenous people, uh, but it was uh, determined to keep out non-British races. Um, a pretty pernicious uh, uh, um, section that still continues in our constitution today. Um, so that, you know, I think there are some, as they say, unfinished business in relation to um, uh, our process of constitutional reform in this country. Um, and so Tila has been there in the heart of that uh, process of uh, creating a, a framework for rethinking uh, our constitution and how we give voice um, to indigenous people. Um, on a very practical level, um, she's also been uh, a leading ad advocate behind the uh, Walama Court which is um, a proposal to establish an Aboriginal sentencing court in New South Wales. Um, outside, there is a copy of the latest Griffith Review, and I should say what a wonderful uh, collection it is. Uh, Teela is a contributing editor. Um, you can read her wonderful essay on the power of matriarchy. Uh, strong women um, play a very important role in First Nations uh, peoples, um, and I think it's an amazing uh, essay in itself, but it's uh, amongst an amazing array of uh, fantastic essays. And um, although I did once work for Griffith University, um, I, I have no shares in the Griffith Review, I should say, but I would really commend it, uh, commend it to you. 
So I'd like to also introduce Billy. Uh, Billy is the editor at The Daily Oz, um, a social first news service that engages with more than 350,000 young Australians. She is also the host of um, No Silly Questions, which is dedicated to breaking down the big issues for young people in an accessible and digestible way. She previously worked as a senior news writer at uh, um, uh, Mamma Mia, uh, where she specialised in stories at the intersection of politics and gender. Um, she's a proud um, uh, alum of uh, our university in media and communications, and she's been a commentator um, on the ABC and in the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, so look, I welcome uh, both Teela and Billy uh, to the stage. Please make them welcome. Thank you. Is this on? Hello. Is this on? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, and I'll also reiterate that there is a Q&A at the end and any and all questions are welcome. But I think that we should start with the election. You might have seen that we have a change of government. We have a new prime minister. And I think it's fair to say that Australians voted pretty decisively for change. Um, and one of the first things that Anthony Albanese said in his victory speech on Saturday night was that the Labor Party will commit to the Uluru Statement in full. And of course, we knew that, but I think that the fact that it was one of the first things he said as Prime Minister um, was incredible to watch. Um, we also have a record number of Indigenous people in Parliament as a result of the election over the weekend. Um, we also have the Teal Independents who, um, I'm pretty sure all of them who got in did um, campaign on implementing the Uluru Statement in full. So it feels like we're on the cusp of change. As it was mentioned, I'm also the editor of The Daily Oz and um, one of the first posts that we did on Sunday was explaining, that's it, what the Uluru Statement from the heart is. And it was actually our most liked post of all time, um, which I think is pretty incredible. We had 60,000 people like it. And then on top of that, thousands of people share it. Um, and I think that it's really telling that that people are engaging in this topic um, in a way that, that feels like we're on the cusp of change. So I guess yeah. my first question to you, Teela, is how do you feel? How do you feel after the election? I'm feeling overwhelmed, but first of all, I just want to actually thank everyone for showing up. Um, this has been a, a really hard slog um, for lots of people um, at the community grassroots level um, and to see the election, um, you know, over the weekend um, and the results come through. Um, it just really goes to show that these physical acts of showing up and engaging in a dialogue um, outside of the mainstream political agenda um, has been so crucial to our movement um, for the Uluru Statement from the Heart. There's been many rooms I have sat in across Australia, as has many other campaigners for the statement, um, speaking to bigger, smaller groups of people, and these are the conversations that are changing our nation. So I really genuinely um, want to thank each of you who have taken a seat here um, for showing up and for those online who, um, who care about this and not just First Nations, but I think we saw, um, you know, and when your post went viral uh, at the Daily Oz, it was just very clear that there is a groundswell of Australian people that are ready to get this job done. So I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling optimistically cautious <laughs> as a result of Saturday night, because we know, you know, Politicians say one thing and, and we, we have to hold them to account now. And everyone in this room has a responsibility to do that. It's not just on First Nations. How so, confident are you that Labor will deliver on its promise? I'm confident that the Australian people will deliver. I think it can be absolutely defining for the Albanese government. Um, th this will make him, I think, in terms of finally having a leader that we've seen that has the courage to commit to getting this unfinished business done. Um, there's been a legacy of leaders before him that promised and things and, and they never came to pass. I have 
total faith in the Australian people um, and it's you walking away, continuing the conversation um, that has held them to account. So, yeah, I have faith in the people. I think it can be absolutely defining for Albanese um, and his administration. I want to go to your role at Sydney Uni so that we understand more of what you do here. Yeah. You've recently been appointed Sydney University's inaugural Indigenous Practitioner in Residence. Fancy name. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're also a senior land rights lawyer. Can you explain what exactly it is that you do at Sydney Uni? Yeah, at Sydney Uni, look, it's been one of those roles, as Simon, the Dean of Law, said earlier, it's the first of its kind here um, at the Sydney Law School. Um, and it's one I think we're really creating on our feet. Like, I think it's important, especially I, I come from a different law school, and um, I won't say the name, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I went to a different law school that had a really heavy presence of First Nations people. And I think that this role, um, you know, I've, I've asked not to have a direct teaching face um, in relation to it because I feel as though um, the real action can happen by students showing up to spaces outside their classroom. Um, and that I've committed myself really to, th to three things. And um, I must say that I hesitated <laughs> um, in, in, the, in the beginning about whether or not to accept um, the role here. And I'm, I'm loving it. Um, it gives me a creative escape in terms of what legal advocacy is. And so I've committed to three things. And that's clearly, you know, as a result of the law school endorsing the Uluru Statement um, to furthering their ambition um, around that. Uh, also a podcast, Black Letter Law. Um, I've taken the content that's going to be live soon. And um, for other lawyers as well in here, thank you, Mintus, and everyone else that's come out. I can see some friends um, from the courts. And that, um, yeah, the, the third thing is rebellious lawyering. So trying to re rethink our roles as lawyers. Um, and, you know, non-traditional ways of lawyering. Go to law school and we're told, you know, this is how the black letter lawyers do it. And that's why I'm a terrible black little lawyer, because I don't play by the rules very well. But no, it's just really reframing lawyering, so rebellious lawyering. Um, and we had our inaugural conference last year, but it was online because of COVID. And how did you become involved in the Uluru Statement from the heart process? It kind of was something that really crystallised in the right moment for me. Um, I, it wasn't long after I finished law school. Um, I was at law school uh, thinking, actually, my mind was very much turned to at the point I was into administrative law and I was very much in the thinking of what an Australian republic could look like. Um, and that had absorbed a lot of my brain during law school in terms of how do I use this for the betterment of my people and our nation and create those changes. So actually, prior to the Uluru Statement, I wrote a chapter um, in a book uh, that Marcia Langdon and Megan Davis um, curated um, called Our Country on what I thought an Australian Republic could be. And then things kind of flowed from there. I worked at the courts with um, Justice Lucy McCallum um, as her tip staff. And it was when I was the judge's tip staff, I was invited into the process that underpinned the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And I want to take you back to 2017, which is when the Uluru Statement from the Heart was delivered. And I know that briefly after it was delivered, you spoke to now former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who rejected the statement from, well, I'm sure most of you know, considering now that none of those reforms have been implemented yet, but he rejected the statement. And you briefly spoke to him on Q&A and you had a bit of a um, back and forth. He, um, yeah, how was that moment um, talking to the Prime Minister at the time who rejected the Uluru Statement from the heart? In all honesty, it felt awful mm -hmm. um, to be spoken to like that by, at that time, the Prime Minister of our country. Um, and from a campaigning point of view, um, I think we anticipated um, a little bit of a pushback, but not to the degree in which it was so disrespected um, and dishonestly treated, you know, labelled as a third chamber, that, you know, it, at, on Q&A when Turnbull was... Uh, 
on the panel, um, the only panellist, um, he told me to wipe my face, it's going to go up in flames. I mean, it's quite emotional because it's been quite an emotional campaign. Mm. And so it didn't feel great, but at the same time, it really did mobilise a lot of campaigners to just go, at no point in history has any Indigenous person been handed anything on a silver platter. We're just going to campaign harder now. And we did. And look where we are. How far do you think we've come in those five years? Oh, I mean, this is kind of the first time I've had to sit down to reflect on actually the campaigning and post the weekend. Um, and I think that it is genuinely, um, you know, I remember waking up the next day and honestly just feeling like I could just take in a deep breath of fresh air and finally sigh and kind of, you know, breathe out the last five years. Um, but I, I do think we need to realise we're not there yet. Um, there is even more work to be done now. Um, let's have that exciting moment um, and, and hold, hold power to account. Let's move to the reconciliation process, um, which started in 1991 after the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. Since then, there's been the Mabo case, um, Paul Keating's Redfern speech, the Sydney Harbour Bridge Walk, Kevin Rudd's apology. Three decades on, what there's been these significant moments, but I'm interested to hear from you, what structural changes do you think there's been or do you think there has been? Well, it's interesting you talk about, you know, you've raised all the things that's happened over the reconciliation era, the three decades. Like, that's my life. It's defined my life. Um, being born and raised into um, a nation where we were supposed to reconcile. Um, but what are we reconciling? And I don't think that we've ever confronted the hard issues about that. We've had, as you said, you know, the, the national apology, sorry speeches, um, walks across the bridge, symbolic gestures. And we've never really dealt with the hard facts that we actually are a nation founded on systemic racism. Um, and it makes us all feel uncomfortable, you know? And I think for so long, um, the three decades of reconciliation, um, I feel as though we, we've always, you know, and this is from my own point of view, we're supposed to feel good about it when in fact our history is bloody and it's, you know, brutal. And those things, for any reasonable-minded person, actually can make you feel uncomfortable. And so I think um, in terms of reflecting on that era, uh, so many people have done incredibly hard advocacy and work, but I do think that we have a long way to go in terms of really dealing with our foundational issues. And that's why I'm, I'm a hardcore supporter of the Uluru Statement, but it, because it doesn't just rely on you know, governments telling First Nations or First Nations, it literally goes to you people. It, it turns to the Australian people and says, it's your job now. Um, we need you to walk on this journey and 3% need the 97% to, to walk with us on this. It's the only way we're going to change um, a system for the better. What do you think is the role of non-Indigenous Australians in this process? I think it's just showing up and taking responsibility for engaging in the dialogue um, and actioning these things. Like, clearly, what we saw over the weekend, people set, they actioned it at the ballot box. Um, and you, we can't underestimate, and I've been asked this question for, for so many, so, for so long now. People often think it's huge, profound gestures that matter, when in fact, actually, it's the small conversations that have the ripple effect. Um, and that's literally what has powered this movement and this dialogue is that the Australian people have taken ownership of it um, and, and gone on their own education journey. Like, even as something so simple as Black Colour Book Club, which we created, um, uh, you know, at the peak of the pandemic, there was so many non-Indigenous Australians who turned to this handle and were like, I really want to learn now more about the truth of our history. I was denied this at school. Can you please direct me to a book, to a story, something I can share with my family or my kids, or do myself 
as well. And we had an overwhelming amount of white Australians turn so generously um, to the handle and go, I'm ready. I'm ready to deal with it. And I just think when you say that, like, it doesn't have to be profound. It's just the simple acts of learning the truth. In your recent essay, The Power of the First Nations Matriarchy, you can get it outside, um, you do on the land rights movement and how important First Nations women have been in terms of transforming the narrative. You gave an example of Mum Shirl and her meeting with Vincent Lingiari. Um, can you tell us about the significance of that and how First Nations women are at the forefront of these movements? Yeah, I mean, what I really wanted to do in this essay was to really illuminate the fact that at each point, each turning point in our history, in our nation's narrative, it's been First Nations women who have been punching up, you know, to the patriarchy, and that they've been so defining in, uh, in movements. Like, Mum Shaw, not many people know, you know, she, one of her first trips out of New South Wales was up to the Northern Territory to meet Vincent Lingiari. And that was so transformative for land rights, which existed 20 years prior to Marbo. Um, and then other people I spoke you know, in the essay talk about 1967. And uh, the, the campaign leading into that was a decade-long campaign. Um, and so I can't complain, you know, it's been five years of this movement, but a decade-long campaign in an era where there was no social media yet, um, 90 point six percent or seven percent of Australians voted yes like what an amazing feat and at the forefront of that movement was First Nations women um, you know educating Australians about why that was so important and then I thread in parts in, of my own life which is why you know I think it's really important to to honor the matriarchy and I should say as well um, one of the things that keeps me going in this movement is the image of Gladys Tapanoka at the footsteps of the High Court of Australia when the Wick people defeated the state of Queensland. So I, in this essay, it's just about retracing history. And I think we don't, what we don't do in Australia is we don't honour the stories of First Nations women who are literally leading these movements. And you also spoke about land back and how you can't separate it from climate justice. Mm. Can you speak about how you merge those two? Yeah, it was just really... Convers the conversations I'm starting to have um, in community, uh, especially with millennial, younger groups like your audience yeah, at TDA would be, like, you know, and climate justice was clearly a priority at the last election. And so I just think what we can't do is we can't separate climate justice from the importance of First Nations voices. We cannot, you know, continue to deny First Nations a seat at the table when we are trying to care for our country. We've cared for it since time immemorial for generations and we know our country the best. And so, yeah, it's just about, I guess, Elevating that as well and making sure that where there is conversations about climate justice, First Nations voices are there. Um, and also the movement towards the enshrining of First Nations voice is absolutely about making sure that there is a sustainable voice beyond these political cycles. And only First Nations can speak to those issues, you know, in terms of how to care for country. It just makes such logistical sense that we are at a tipping point with the voice and climate justice and we need to start thinking about them both together. And there's been a number of past petitions. Can you tell us about the importance of the history of those movements and how the Uluru Statement from the Heart is different to those? Yeah, it's so interesting because well, obviously we're living in the now and the now is the Uluru Statement, but the history of First Nations petitions is so long. You know, it goes back to Sir William Cooper's letter to the king um, uh, calling for more federal um, voices at the decision-making table. That's the Yakala Bark petitions. It's the Barunga Statement. It's the Larrakia petition. Um, I think people often forget that the Uluru Statement is just one of many petitions in our nation's history. The difference is 
with the Uluru Statement, we didn't gift it to politicians. The strategy was, was literally to the people. And that was, that, that's a defining difference in the strategic way in which the campaign is unfolding now. Um, so, and you know, as well, and we've had discussions about this previously, I actually don't think that the Uluru Statement is, is really the most defining in terms of turning the wheels of this ship. You know, in 2015, there was the Kirribilli Statement. And in 2015, a group of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders met with Abbott and, the, you know, the, the leader and the leader of the opposition at the time. And it was that point when First Nations leaders met and said, if you're going to go down this path of recognising us, then you need to have First Nations input into this conversation. You know, it was, it was Howard um, who, who mentioned constitutional recognition um, as a promise. It was, you know, in the Republic kind of vote as well, um, there was an attempt to put First Nations in the preamble um, at that vote. Um, so the curability, my point is the curability statement, if people were listening in 2015, if governments were listening in 2015, the Uluru Statement was not a surprise at all especially from a First Nations point of view, um, it was actually, it made complete sense. Um, it already said we'd rejected symbolism. It already said, don't tinker just with the race power. We want substantive change. And so at that point in time in 2015, in fact, the ship did turn a bit more towards substantive constitutional recognition. At that point, um, it was really about leading us towards the process of the Uluru Statement, which was the first time <laughs> governments asked First Nations, how would they like to be recognised? And, you know, there were conversations in these dialogues and First Nations, these, these were difficult debates. I mean, when you've got a group of um, any citizen from different political spectrums um, talking about their civic rights, it's, it's absolutely difficult to hard to navigate, especially navigating a nation that has always let us down. Um, being now called back to the table to do the hard work. Um, and then, you know, getting to the point of the Uluru Statement was so profound um, because finally there was a consensus position um, on what that model of recognition should look like. Um, you know, we're not done, you know, we're done in terms of the preamble and symbolism. What's only at, and the referendum council made it very clear um, that there was only one recommendation for constitutional reform, and that's a First Nations voice as a result of that process. And so um, it, it actually is really offensive um, to have governments speak to us, in, I think, in the way past governments, um, in terms of how it was dismissed, um, particularly by the, lead, the previous leader. Um, but it didn't stop us from campaigning at the grassroots level, and we know that's where the power is. Can you speak briefly, because we've got... Um, so the first step is enshrining a voice to parliament mm. in the constitution, but then there's two other steps, the Makarada Commission, which involves the treaty and the truth-telling. Yep. Can you speak briefly about that? Because I think it's something that we don't often hear about because, of course, we're also focused on, on the first step. Yep. Um, yeah, so there is a sequence mm. to um, getting the mandate within the Uluru Statement across the line. The mandate, voice first, Makarata next. Um, and that's because we know that there have been many truth-telling forums in the past. You know, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, that was a fact-finding process. The Royal Commission into Dondale, that was a fact-finding process. Every coronial that, inquiry that comes out of another Aboriginal death in custody, that's a fact-finding process. Don't sit here and tell us Australians actually don't know the truth, because I think we all feel the truth. We just don't want to deal with it. And so I think really, um, and this is a better way to explain it, I guess, you know, truth-telling was never one of the reforms put to the process. So an example, um, when post curability statement, then into the process uh, 
of going to First Nations and putting models before them of what potentially to debate. So there was a voice, there was amending um, the race power, there was implementing an anti-discrimination clause, there was a preamble and an agreement making power, five things put to the room. But what we saw was, and it was really powerful because for me, um, particularly as a young person in the First Nations community um, and as a very young lawyer at the time, th those times when it's filled with, with First Nations elders, I listen. It's not my role to, um, to impose an opinion when elders are speaking. And so what we saw was we saw elders stand up in a room, get the microphone and, and really lament the history of our nation, the massacres that occurred. So a whole day had to be embedded in the front end of the process because it ended up being this truth-telling. It naturally unfolded into this truth-telling of the fact that um, where he's speaking the truth, here we are again sanctioned by the state to come and have these conversations. How can we even trust the state to deliver? Um, and you know, some communities, you know, have, have got um, people who have massacred their people as monuments in their towns, things like that. And so, uh, you know, at the time as well, a lot of resources were going out of communities. Um, funding was drying up for housing. Uh, this is just as well, you know, when not long after Abbott said, you know, living in an Indigenous community is a lifestyle choice. So lots of things were really bubbling to the surface in these conversations. And um, it was powerful in the sense that elders understood we can talk truth day in, day out, but are these fellows going to listen to us? Every community you go into, every black community, they are talking truth every day. So the strategy needed to be a sequence. It needed to be, if they want to talk the truth as well, there is an obligation on white Australia to step up with us. There's an obligation to hear us. There's an obligation to continue a dialogue um, because it's not just the suffering of our people, it's what other people did to us. Um, and that takes, too, I think, an equal share and an equal stake in that conversation. And so the energy and um, the focus absolutely is right now getting our nation to a referendum and winning that um, because I don't think we can have a fair and truthful conversation until we're seen as equals at that truth ta table. And then the, the other element, the treaty, is that we know there are going to be many treaties. There's going to be have to, have to be many treaties amongst against First Nations and governments, but also First Nations ourselves. And so that, that process and trying to retrofit a process that the state failed to do um, at first contact as a country, we are structurally different to many other liberal democracies in that way. Um, and so the sequence is strategic, it's purposeful, um, and we know those other things, there might not be a beginning and end to truth-telling, but it's an ongoing process. The last referendum was in 1999, the Republican referendum, which was unsuccessful. What do you think, <laughs> um, what do you think needs to be done to have a successful referendum this time? And do you think that the landscape is different? I mean, obviously we have social media now, which we, they didn't have in 1999. Yeah. What do you think needs to be done to have a successful referendum? I think we need every single Australian stepping up um, and, and being on the right side of history um, and, and making sure that everyone understands they're a campaigner and advocate in this. Um, look, honestly, it's not my expertise. Like, I, I, as a campaigner, like, it's almost like the rule is there is no rule. <laughs> like we've gone out to the people and no one gives you a handbook um, on how to win a referendum. Well, at least I've never seen one. So if anyone out there has one, send it my way. But um, there are, we know we can turn to points in our history um, and we know we can look at why referendums like the Republican referendum failed. Where if people with one, you don't have a leader taking it seriously. Um, uh, you know, Howard at the time, and you need to crystallise the moment. I think the question and the information um, needs to be uh, succinct and but also informative enough to not confuse people. Um, 
So, you know, there are other layers to it. There's been lots of people telling campaigners we need bipartisanship, we need this, we need that. But we don't know that now. The, look at our parliament. It looks very different um, in terms of what it looked like in 1999. Uh, and if we, we need the support to get a bill across the line, absolutely. Um, Labor have a majority government. We've got a huge crossbench of support with the Teals. Um, but it will take uh, a really solid campaign um, in getting the yes vote. But I think it's galvanising. It absolutely is. Um, we're either going to be a nation that falls on the right or wrong side of history, and I prefer to be on the right side of history. Do you think that you'll need bipartisan support? You'll need the coalition to... We to have, have people within the right of centre very supportive. Um, very supportive. Um, there has been a lot of work done across the political spectrum. Um, I think that time will tell who, if the, who the Liberals choose as their leader. Um, Dutton, who seems to be, you know, the one who might get it or not, um, It'll make campaigning very interesting, but it absolutely won't stop us from going um, full on for it. And I think that we can be in this moment having some comfort that um, we do have supporters um, left leaning and willing to, to, to have a good dig within their own party as well. And I'm interested, when we spoke yesterday, you briefly mentioned that the media hasn't always been the nicest to this campaign and there's been some really difficult times with the media and also social media, what, do you, what role do you think the media and also social media will play in, in this referendum and in the process of getting it through? Well, I think we've seen as well with the amount... Like when An interesting kind of different example is when social media went boom, I think we lost so many prime ministers in a very quick, short amount of time. So we know that it has the power to, uh, to really change in politics. Um, I think there is a difference between social media and media. Um, we, we need forensically accurate media in Indigenous spaces to, to get this right um, and, and, and present the facts uh, because I think the facts really reveal themselves uh, and, and we need good journalists doing that, that work. But it's, of course, it's going to play a role. It's going to play a huge role. Um, and I think there are lots of people getting across the reforms and getting across the history and getting across what the statement is calling for. Um, and we're seeing that. Mm. Well, I think we're going to play the two-minute video. But I think before we do that, you're going to read out the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, Don't I pop yet. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to stand up? Yeah, I might stand for this. Um, yeah. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise that a people's possessed a land for 60 millennia 
and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. It cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk into worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We seek constitutional reforms and we call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreements between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. As we leave base camp and start our vast track across this country, we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. That's the Uluru Statement. And I think we have a quick video because you're launching a campaign. Do you want to talk quickly about the campaign? Yeah, so that's the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, as Simon said, Sydney Law School has endorsed it and we've just got some uh, footage coming out tomorrow. So I just wanted to share with you um, a piece of that and also a reflection from some students. So this is what we'll see before we break out to, to socialise. So enjoy. And then we also have question and answer. Oh, do we after. Have, oh, we have question. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll sit up here and watch it. Okay, yes, yes, yes. yes. But then question and answer. So get your questions ready. <laughs> For a long time, for 200 and something years, it's been Europeans or white settlers making decisions for and about Aboriginal people. Um, and I think if we're ever gonna, you know, make steps in self-determination, Aboriginal people know Aboriginal people best. Um, so I think it's really important that we're the ones making decisions that directly affect us. 2022, we still don't have a framework where Indigenous people are represented into our legal, legislative, and constitutional processes. I don't think our histories are told and owned by the nation. First Nations have never ceded sovereignty to their lands and their waters. It is our responsibility now to redefine our nation. And it is our responsibility now in 2022 to walk together towards a referendum to enshrine a First Nations voice in our constitution. So when we look at the voice from the heart and when we look at this statement, 
how can we not be moved to recognise its importance as we move into the next phase of our history and our maturity? Do you want this unfinished business to continue going on for the next generations to deal with? It is time now. 1967, we were counted, and in 2017, we wanted to be heard, and that really resonates with me. There are two lines in there that really resonate with me. And one is talking about how 60 millennia worth of our histories, how could they be erased in 200 years? The other part that resonates with me is where we're calling for our rightful place in our own country. Well, so the protection of the enshrinement in the parliament is kind of essential because I understand there's been quite a lot of uh, indigenous based policy that's kind of just been left behind, uh, hasn't really been recognised or enforced. And so it's essential that it's provided that protection specifically from the constitution. Having the constitutionally enshrined voice ensures that whichever party's in power will still have that voice in Parliament. This unfinished business is a matter for all Australians to walk with us together on this journey of reckoning, of reconciliation and redefining the rightful place of First Nations in our national narrative. No, are there any questions? Yes. Your question? I'll also get this. Thank you very much. It's inspiring and encouraging. Michael Davis is my name. Um, this is also 15 years since the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was at last recognised by the Rudd government. And that's all about self-determination, as is the Uluru Statement. I just wanted to hear what your views are about the prospects of real um, uh, self-determination for peoples, for Indigenous peoples, walking together in Australia. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, the, the right to self-determination was also the key recommendation that came out of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Um, it's been spoken about a lot across decades, and indeed, um, it was endorsed under the UNDRIP. Um, uh, and so I think in terms of how we um, ensure that in Australia, it has to be put into hard law. It has to be protected. Um, it has to be sustainable. And self-determination can look differently, different to many different communities. It doesn't have to look the same. I think that's one thing in Australia as well. It expects First Nations to all have the same position when in fact actually white Australia or multicultural Australia don't even have the same views often. I think the right to self-determination at its heart, you know, Article 3 in the UNDRIP is so much about social, political and economic um, empowerment. And those things might look differently to different communities and it's about communities making decisions for their communities. So I think the first step in, in, in protecting that is a referendum and ensuring that those grassroots voices at the community level are heard. Any other questions? Yep, there's one there. If we can get a microphone. Yep, the microphone's coming. <laughs> But it's not only a black fella problem, it's Australia's problem. We must be joined on that. The other uh, issue, this is probably the other, arguably the biggest strategic issue that Australia has got at the moment. Alongside of this, I would say that the national agreement on closing the gap, closing the gap in partnership, supports this. We must not allow the closing the gap to become a coffee table document. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are, thank you um, for, for your question as well and for your input into tonight. Um, my, my position on Close the Gap is I think it's revealed that governments can't do this alone by telling us what to do and what targets they want met. Um, and that 
My observation, and I wouldn't say my expertise, but my observation is there's been, you know, it was supposed to, the gap was already supposed to be closed. If you look back at the initial date that they said they would close it by, clearly it's government's failing us at this point because so many resources get put into this as well. But what I have observed um, is I feel as though a lot of responsibility is going on First Nations peoples without the resources and the empowerment to actually control and make decisions about our communities. Um, I think there's a different layer to the problem as well, which is we need the feds and the states to actually start to work together on delivering this um, cohesively. Um, and I think that we will see um, a transformative change when we are seeing not just the same voices at this elite level, but the grassroots being empowered at their community organisational level um, to have a say in the resources that go into their community. I think we're a long... To, unfortunately, I think we're not where we're supposed to be. I, you know, I hate saying it, but we're just not. Um, it's because we've never had a go at this. We've never had a go at, actually, let's listen to First Nations and empower them. Um, yeah, that, that's just where I'll leave that. Are we wrapping up? Is that yeah, sorry. My eyes aren't that good. But I think that that's all we have time for. Thank you so much. Yes, look, yes. Um, thank you, thank you, uh, Billy, uh, for being an amazing host and, uh, and doing us proud. Um, but uh, thank you, Tila. Uh, I have to say, the, uh, reading the statement was amazing. And hashtag inspiring legal minds. Yes, you know, I think that um, not only we have leadership for good on display, but we have really inspiring um, uh, legal mind in our presence. So thank you, Tila, for everything you do. I'd like to thank uh, the Sydney Ideas team for putting on an amazing event and uh, to the audience uh, uh, and not forgetting those online. Um, the uh, Sydney Ideas event will be available on podcast in the next few days, so please take the opportunity to review it, maybe even share it with some friends, uh, and it will be posted on the Sydney Ideas website and on YouTube. Uh, and of course, check the website for more information about upcoming events and subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, and now, with thanks to Minta Allison, we invite you to join us for canapes and drinks outside. Thank you, and good night. Killed it. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Oh, so good. Yeah. Well done. <laughs>